What's up guys? My name is Robert Griffin III. I'm a quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens. Do you want to know what a baseball, a football, and a rocket have in common? Find out now. This, this is Stem in 30. And I'm Beth. Today we are at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. We'll be taking a look at humans' first venture to another world, the Apollo program. This museum is incredible. Let's take a look at the Museum of Flight. Hi, I'm Ted Hutter, and welcome to the Museum of Flight. The Great Gallery is a breathtaking six-story glass building with 43 aircraft from the 1920s to the present including a rare M21 Blackbird spy plane. Next to the Great Gallery is the original Boeing aircraft factory, a walk through Boeing history. While in the adjacent building, dramatic galleries house 28 fighter planes and rare personal artifacts from World Wars I and II. The Space Gallery looks at the space shuttle story and today's new space race. It is also the permanent home to NASA's space shuttle trainer that was used by every shuttle astronaut. Outside is the three-acre aviation pavilion with its World War II bombers and airliners from the 1930s to the present. Thanks for visiting, and we hope to see you again at the Museum of Flight. We're here to learn about Apollo and the first trip to the moon. Right now, the Apollo 11 command module is here on display at the Museum of Flight. 50 years ago, humans landed on the lunar surface and took that first small step. From 1969 to 1972, there were six total missions that landed on the moon, with 12 humans stepping foot on the lunar surface. They conducted science experiments and brought back over 800 pounds of moon rocks that are still being studied today. They explored craters, took amazing pictures, and even drove a buggy on the surface of the moon. There was supposed to be a seventh mission to the moon, but it was now considered a successful failure. A small explosion caused Apollo 13 to circle the moon and return to Earth without landing. Flight director Gene Kranz is credited with one of the most famous lines in space history. And as with any great accomplishment, it took a great big team of people to bring the astronauts home safely. To me, the toughest thing I had to do was to learn to listen. Uh, in mission control, we have a very rugged uh, set of people who run us through. And uh, they identified very quickly that I was making their decisions rather than letting them make the decisions. And one day they just embarrassed me to the point they blew me out of the water. They literally exploded to me. And if you look at the, uh, the way I operate today, you look at the movie Apollo 13. I had the longest communications cord in the room. When I had somebody telling me something, I'd get up, get away from the console, get away from the data, and just stroll back and forth. And my team always knew decision time would come when I sat down at the console. Okay, here's what we're going to do. There were no smaller roles in mission control. We were a team. And we went into that room as a team and we came out as a team. Every player right down to the last secretary. I had to be smart enough to ask the first good question. After that, that would uh, get the communications flow going so that we could address problems. 
Uh, failure is uh, and it's an ingredient in life. It's an agreement, ingredient in growing. Probably the worst failure of my life and our lives as mission controllers is when we uh, uh, lost our crew in the Apollo 1 fire. And we lived with that failure. And what we did about it, though, became very important. We sat and established a set of values, a set of standards that we would all live up to. They were expectations for ourselves and for others. Uh, failure is, is an incredible, intense learning process. And if you use it as a learning process, it was, it was worthwhile. I'm Gene Kranz. I was a former flight director during Gemini, Apollo, and Skylab, and later I served duties as the director of mission operations for NASA Johnson Space Center. We are joined by Jeff Nunn, adjunct curator of space history here at the Museum of Flight. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. My absolute pleasure. <laughs> All right, well, Jeff, we're standing in front of the Apollo 11 command module. Put this into perspective for us. Okay, so this command module flew 50 years ago this year. It was the first time humans had set foot on the moon. The Apollo 11 mission carried astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and command module pilot Michael Collins to the moon Neil and Buzz landed, and everything that came back had to fit inside this little gumdrop. Let's put this journey into perspective. You're right. To help us out, we've got some middle school friends. Come on in. And they brought some stuff with them to help us here. Whoop. So we've got a soccer ball and we've got a baseball. Our soccer ball represents the Earth, and the baseball represents the moon. And you all are going to do a little scale comparison for us. So you're going to talk to each other and figure out if this is the Earth and that's the moon, how far apart do you think they are from each other? Okay, so maybe like maybe probably pretty far. Like, yeah, yeah. And turn around. Back. Maybe we'll it has to be yeah. pretty far away. Yeah. yeah like, you agree with that? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. All right, so you guys think this is where it goes? Yeah. All right, that is a great guess. You all did an awesome job. But to show you how far it actually is from the Earth to the moon, we're going to have to pop outside. It actually doesn't fit in here. All right, let's go. Let's outside. go. <laughs> We have okay. moved outside and we're going to check on your all scale. Show us again how far apart you thought the Earth and the Moon were. Okay, that's a great guess, but we're going to do a little bit of math to figure out how far apart they actually are. Jeff, how wide is it around the circumference of the Earth? So the distance going all the way around the Earth is about 25,000 miles. Okay, and how far is it from the Moon to the Earth? It was uh, approximately 240,000, 250,000 miles. All right, so we're going to use 250,000 miles as our ball, ballpark estimate here. And what we're going to do is we are going to do a little multiplication. So the circumference of the Earth, 25,000 miles times 10, would give us our 250,000 miles to the moon. So Beth's got a string here, and you all are going to wrap that string around the Earth 10 times. All right, go for it. All right, great job. So now we've got the string marked here. Moon, take your end. Earth, keep that string on there and let's stretch it out and see. Further, yeah. Keep moving. So there we've got our scale model of the <laughs> Earth to the moon. It's a little farther than y'all thought, isn't it? A little, yeah, a little. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Just a little bit. So this puts into perspective how far it is from the Earth to the moon. The Earth is revolving around the sun and rotating on its axis. And the moon is revolving around the Earth. And in order to get a rocket from the Earth to the moon, it has to be able to hit a moving target. We got an opportunity to talk to someone who is outstanding in his field at doing just that, hitting a moving target. I'm joined by Baltimore Ravens quarterback and Heisman Trophy winner Robert Griffin III. Thanks for helping us out today. Thank you for having me. All right, now you've thrown for over 9,000 yards in the NFL. You're pretty good at throwing a football. Can we see what that looks like? Oh, no problem. 
Right here we got Willie Sneed. He's got the best hair in the business. Awesome. Now that throw looked pretty easy. Right. Why? Uh, it's, it's from point A to point B, so you kind of know where the guy's going to be at. Uh, it's predetermined and I can just literally throw it right at him. Now that's not what happens in a game, is it? No, normally that's not what happens. <laughs> normally the guys are moving and running around with defenders, so you kind of have to anticipate where they're going to be at. So you throw it to a point uh, as opposed to throwing it exactly where they're at. Can we see that? Yeah, we can. Ready? That was incredible. What's going through your mind when you make a throw like that? Well, it's really just about making sure I'm on the same timing with my receiver. Uh, if I'm trying to throw it on a route like that to where he's at, it'll be behind him. It'll be way past that point. So I have to anticipate where he's going to be at and where he's going to finish. So I throw it right to that point and he can run through. Awesome. So throwing a football to where the player is going to be is kind of like launching a rocket to the moon. When the Saturn V rocket launched from Earth, the moon was a long way from where it would be three days later. The moon travels over 2,000 miles per hour. The rocket had to launch toward a spot where the moon would be when the astronauts arrived. In order to do this, it involved a whole lot of math. Robert, there is one big difference between launching a rocket to the moon and playing football in the NFL. What's that? You don't have 300 pound guys trying to tackle a Saturn V rocket. That's very true. <laughs> All right, well, we're back in by the command module, and we're going to talk about communicating with the astronauts as they were orbiting the moon and when they're on the surface of the moon. Today, we communicate using these, right? So this is a phone. Does anyone know what this is? Telephone. That's a telephone. How do you use it? You Dial. spin it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This is a rotary phone, and in 1969, this is how you made a phone call. You would stick your finger where the number is, and you would spin the dial. So communicating back in 69 was a little different than it is today, and it required, when they were around the moon, a line of sight. So we had to have a direct line to those astronauts. On the command module, there were antennas that pointed back to Earth, and when the astronauts went down to the moon, they deployed an antenna that was always in contact with Earth because of line of sight. However, the command module sometimes lost line of sight. So let's talk a little bit about that. So you're going to be our command module pilot. So grab our command module here, and we're going to send you off in the distance. So you're out around the moon. We're going to have you slide over a little bit, and I'll let you hold the mirror here. And I am going to very carefully turn on this laser pointer. There we go. So we now have line of sight. Our laser beam here is hitting our command module. We've got line of sight communication. But there's a problem here. There is a problem. Because sometimes that command module goes around the side of the moon. All right, and so head around. And keep what happens? Going. So what's the problem now? Where's the She's not in the line of sight. She's not in the line of sight. So we don't have that line of sight. We can't communicate with her. And that's what it was like when Michael Collins was on the far side of the moon. You flew the command module by yourself around the far side of the moon where there was no communications. Yes. Was that isolating? No, it was a wonderful experience and it was nice in a way that you might not expect, but the fact that it was quiet, silent, utterly, was good, not bad. It gave me a little time off from mission control telling me this, that, and the other. So I, I enjoyed the, the time by myself. How long was that break around the backside? Uh, 55 minutes, maybe something like that. So you get a full hour of quiet. Close to it, yeah. Time to yourself. Sometimes Michael Collins is called the loneliest man in history. As we've got Lucy, the loneliest girl in the gallery right now, hanging out behind the command module. We don't have line of sight. So I have a question for you all. If we've got astronauts on the far side of the moon or even Mars, how might we be able to get a signal to them if we don't have line of sight communication? What could we do? Could you move the line of sight? Ooh, could we move the line of sight? How might we be able to do that? Reflectors. Maybe a reflector, or what else could we put around the moon or Mars to help us? What's going around the Earth that helps us communicate? Satellites. Satellites, that's exactly right. So we could deploy satellites that would help relay those signals. So you are going to be our satellite, all right? So you're going to go over here in line of sight, head on over that way. All right, now watch where the laser beam is. 
And you've got your satellite with you. Hold your satellite up for us. All right, now we want you to bounce our signal over to the command module. Let's see if you can do it. Lucy, tell us when you've got communication. <laughs> She's no longer the loneliest girl in the gallery. No, we can communicate <laughs> with her because we're relaying those signals via satellite. And this is how we will be able to talk to astronauts as they go to Mars. So we've talked a little bit about how we're going to communicate with the astronauts when they're on Mars and when they're on the moon. But have you ever thought about how much ground the first moonwalk actually covered? Check this out. In the summer of 1969, baseball fans across North America cheered as Willie McCovey and Harmon Killebrew slugged their way toward MVP awards. The Miracle Mets shocked the world on their way to a championship, and expansion teams took the field in Seattle, San Diego, Kansas City, and Montreal, Canada. The first time America's game stepped foot outside the boundaries of the United States. But on that fateful summer, Americans traveled even further to another world. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin explored only a tiny piece of the lunar surface, an area about the size of a baseball field. Imagine the lunar lander touched down on the pitcher's mound. Traveling down the base paths, this is the view Armstrong and Aldrin saw from where first base would be. Yeah, right clear. How's it going? Roger, the EVA is progressing beautifully. Once you get to second base, you peer back toward the pitcher's mound and see the lunar lander. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. Rounding third base, you would see the TV camera that captured some of the first footage from the surface of the moon. TV coverage of the scene. And on the way home, you would pass the flag. Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the limit. Welcome to the Gravity Games. The games that pit professional athletes against middle school students. Today we have professional soccer players from the Rain FC versus our mighty middle school students. This may seem like a bit of an unfair competition, but don't forget these are the Gravity Games. Our middle school students will be competing as if they are on the surface of the moon, which has one-sixth the gravity of Earth. Let's begin by meeting our mighty middle school students. Ronan Jenkins, Lake Washington Girls Middle School. Elena Haw, Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. Now, let's meet our professional soccer players. Darian Jenkins, Rain FC. Megan Oyster, Rain FC. Today, our athletes will be competing in the Lunar Leap and the Marshmallow Meteor Kick. As well as the Moon Jump. I think everybody's ready. Let the games begin. Let's go to the Moon Jump. There goes Mouse Ears. They've got the right stuff. Oh my goodness, could that be any higher? Well, let's move on to the Lunar Leap. Pigtails is really doing well. Ooh, good job, laser beams. My favorite event is the Marshmallow Meteor Kick. And the delicious. Oh my goodness, it looks like that one might make it into orbit. Woo! Nice kick! 
Our professional soccer player won the round. However, we have to factor in that our middle school students are competing on the surface of the moon. So when we factor that in, our middle school student takes the day. Congratulations to both teams, but looking at the scoreboard, our middle school students are today's champions. Way to go, mighty middle schoolers. Our students were competing as if they were on the surface of the moon. But don't forget, once the astronauts were finished, they had to make it back to Earth. And in order to do that, they needed someone in mission control to help them out. Poppy Northcutt was the first female to work in mission control. Poppy, thank you so much for being here today. I'm thrilled to be here. Tell us, what was your role during the Apollo program? I was, a, they called us a return to Earth specialist, okay? My job was the development of a family of programs that were used for trajectory design. And one of those programs was the one that targeted getting out of orbit around the moon and coming back to the Earth. Did you face any obstacles being the first female in mission control that you had to overcome? Well, I think women in general faced a lot of obstacles in the whole area of tech. Um, not, not so specifically about mission control, but just working in technology at all. We had, there, women were not expected to do that kind of work. Anywhere you went, you would be the only woman in the room typically, and always felt like you were being watched and under scrutiny. Describe what your role was in bringing the, those astronauts back. Well, I was there to support the retrofire officer, and uh, as I said, we had developed this computer program that targets your return. Doing the targeting to come back to the Earth from the Moon was not the, a big problem. The big problem, as it turned out, were, were environmental problems on the spacecraft. The decent propulsion en engine was used to bring us back, and we had simulated using the decent propulsion engine. There was nothing new for us about doing that. Uh, we were completely prepared to do that, and our program worked great, you know, and uh, that part of it was easy, but everybody was biting their nails and worrying the whole way home because of the heat problem and the oxygen problem on board. What are the small little gold things on the side of the uh, command module? The astronauts were in space for a little over a week. What are some of the things that you'd have to do in space over the course of a week? You'd um, you'll have to well, eat, drink, mm -hmm. have a safe shelter, and have a place to go to the bathroom. That's right. So you'd have to have a place to go to the bathroom. So what do you think the astronauts did with all of the things they produced when they went to the bathroom. Uh, they released it? Yeah, so those ports are actually, to put it simply, pee ports. They would dump the urine overboard as they were, were traveling and they, they needed a, a way to let it out into, into space while the astronauts were still able to, to remain comfortable inside a pressurized command module. Because you would not want to live with that for a week. Right. You all had some great questions. And we're celebrating 50 years of landing on the moon. And we're going back. 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. It's very pretty out here. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule. 
that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and to stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. The successes of today are because of the trials and tribulations of the past. We are going back to the moon and beyond. These future accomplishments will be built on the legacy of Apollo. We are out of time for today. We want to thank our friends at the Museum of Flight, the Tacoma Rain, and the Baltimore Ravens. We'd like to thank Boeing for their generous support of this program with additional support provided by Raytheon. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching. watching.